Hallelujah. I want us to conclude this message we started a few weeks ago on the, the signature and seal of our salvation. This is part seven, the concluding part. The signature and, this, and, and seal of our salvation. We've said so many things about this, but one thing that is very important for you to understand is that God love we cannot comprehend. It was through his love he brought down his son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. I don't think we deserve it. I personally, I'm not taking this for granted. I don't think we deserve it. As we're going to see today in this concluding past, it's a mystery. For all that we have done to God, we have disappointed him, but he did not allow himself to be disappointed. And then he made a way for us. His son came to this world. He sealed up our salvation. He made himself the signature. He died on the cross. The third day he resurrected. He became the firstborn. And you know what? One thing that we just want to appreciate God for is that whatever Jesus promised us, he himself was able to do it. And so which means that he's faithful to keep all his promises. He resurrected. And that's why only in God we can live. Only in Christ we can live. In Christ only can we live. As we're going to see in this concluding part. In God we move. In God we live. In God we have our being. If there's anyone that has not given his or her life to Jesus Christ, such a person cannot understand what he or she is missing. Apart from missing the eternal rest and eternal peace with God, to have that relationship, through his death on the cross of Calvary, through his resurrection, like we have been told, the relationship was restored that we lost in the garden. was restored. The fellowship is not an ordinary fellowship. It's not just that two, three people gathered. No, that fellowship, the fellowship, the eternal fellowship was restored. It's a mystery, as we're going to see. It's a mystery. And God reached out to everybody, everyone, even myself, a Gentile. God reached out to us, as we're going to see in this concluding part. Because of me, purposely, God encountered Saul while he was on the way to Damascus. He was encountered, and he, he was turned to apostle Paul. And he became an apostle to the Gentiles. He reached out to us. We don't supposed to be part of it. The Bible says in, in John chapter 1 from verse 11 to 12, it said, He came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many that have received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God, even those that have believed in his name. I want to thank God because his own did not receive him. Then, I'm now qualified. You are qualified. If you can accept Christ, you are qualified to be called his children. To be called, all of us, we are qualified to be called his children. If you gave your life to Christ, you are a child of God. You are qualified to be called a child of God. If you give your life to Christ, because as many that have received him, to them gave him power to become sons and the daughters of God. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9 says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's by grace alone we have been saved. In this series, do not forget I told you, your church is not going to save you. No. No religious creed or church creed can save you. No. No religious commitment is worthy enough to save you. No. Not even the material things you give to God. Not even your time that we are giving to God. Not even your talent that you are given to God is sufficient. In fact, you'll be insulting God if you think that those things are equivalent to something that can save you. No! They are nothing. They are nothing. They are nothing before God. Because God can exist without you. So what are you telling me? That what we are giving to God is what God is going to use to turn, to turn things around or to make his life better? No! So you are saved by grace. And by grace alone. It's a privilege if you have the opportunity to serve the Lord. It's a privilege. It's a privilege if you have something to give unto the Lord. Either material things. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. If from the time God has given you, you can return back to God part of your time to serve him. It's a privilege. 
If there's a talent God has given you, if you're able to return back to God and serve God with this talent, it's a privilege. Because there's nothing you have that you did not receive from God. The signature and seal of our salvation. If God is worthy to be praised, it's worthy to be served. It's a good God. Love is the driving, the driving force. It's love. The driving force, what brought this relationship, what brought this fellowship, is love. The love, the love of God to us is a mystery. As Apostle Paul was explaining, see, this thing is not something you can understand with human logic. This thing is a mystery. That even while we are yet sinners, while we are seeing the world, we don't know what we are doing. Christ made provision for us. He saved us. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why you are still doing your own thing over there? You will have been crushed by Satan. Why you are doing your own thing? And that will be stretched to hell fire. For God kept you. He kept you. And he, he brought you to himself. It's the mystery. It's, you know, it's love is the driving force. John, first John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. Look, read from verse 1. Say, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. That we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us. They don't understand. When the world, when they see you, they don't know what to carry. They don't know. You are special. You are, no, you are, no, however little you may be, however your gender, your, your accent, your race, However, if you are a Christian, you are born again, the world, the world does not know what to carry. They think you are ordinary. Look at what John Apostle John was talking there. He said, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, in, in him purifies himself just as he is pure. No matter what I can tell you uh, that are the benefits of our acceptance of Christ as Lord and Savior, no matter what I can tell you are uh, the advantages or the enjoyment you can have from the death and the resurrection of Christ on the cross, the eyes, the, this word, they have not seen anything. Because we cannot complete everything that will be. But one thing we know that when Christ will come, when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. These benefits are just so many. We can continue to talk about this benefit till eternity. We cannot be able to explain it all. For anyone who is very smart, Anyone who is born again, who has this hope, hope beyond this horizon, hope beyond this place, such a person will prepare himself and he will prefer himself. Such a person will not be complacent. Such a person will use everything, will be sold out for the Lord. Such a person will give all for the Lord. If you have this hope we are talking about, if you are a Christian, you are born again, you have given your life to Christ, you have forsaken your sin, you have repented of your sin. That is, you have turned back. You are going in the opposite direction from the life you were living before. If you, have, if you have this kind of changes in your life, not just coming to the church, not just doing activities, not just talking, uh, talking about Christ, not just mixing together with Christians, but uh, you have turned around. You have repented. Repented means you have turned in opposite direction from your former way of life. You are not going on the same route. You turn, you detour. And you are following this route, this other way that Christ laid down. Then if you have this hope that now you are a Christian, you must prefer yourself. You must not just be complacent. You must know that this is eternal. You must know that this relationship is great. You must know that this fellowship is wonderful. And then you live according to these promises and this hope that you have. This is what Apostle John was explaining to us. See, because it is only in Christ, genuinely in this life, it is only in Christ you can live a life 
of life. There are people that are living in this world, they are dead. You just see them walk, walking around the street. Only a Christian is alive. Amen? Am I explaining this to you? See, all the people you see on the street, if they are not born again, they are dead people just walking. Only a Christian is alive. Because only in God we move, we live, we have our being. Any Christian, look, when you are absent in the body, automatically because of the fact that he, he has been the signature and the seal of our salvation, automatically you will be present with God. There is no doubt about that. And that's why that life is in you. That life is not until you are dead that you have that. That life is, Christ is in you. It's the hope of the world. First John chapter 4 from verse 9 to 10. First John 4 verse 9 to 10. Says, in, this, in this the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world. That we might live through him. Only in Christ we can live. Amen. If there is no Christ in you, you are not living. You are dead. Am I explaining this to us? It's not that you are not breathing. You are breathing. You are breathing. Because the breath of life that is in you is what is making you to move your body, move your hands around. But when that life is taken out, when the, that breath of God is taken out, a man will become dead. The body, which means the body becomes, we, we, we now subject to decay. But not until that happens. You are not only moving around, but you, you, are, you are a spirit. That is, there is a life in you. That the, world, that the world that does not know Christ does not have that same life that you have in you. That is why you are special. So if you are here today, you have not given your life to Christ, think about Christ. That's most, the most important thing in this relationship, that Christ is our life, that we might live through him. In this, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to pay for our sins. Do you love God? You're going to tell me you love God. No, we don't love God. Not that we love God. Look, no matter who you are, he loves you. That is why we have to come to God as you are. Don't think, don't think that you are the worst sinner. No. Come to God as you are. He loves you. Not that we love him. He, he love, he, look, the love of God is, is agape. It, it's not like when I... See, that's why I don't like when people, when ministers are saying that when you give God this one, you know, you give God five dollars, he's going to give you ten dollars. God is more than that. Do you, do you get what I'm talking about? God is, is more than material things. It's more than that. Because I told you, even abalists, 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 they have these material things we are talking about. If you play the game like the world we play the game, you have money. Hello? There are many, many ways to have this money. Some people, they have, they have sacrificed their best one to have money. Their best the best of their children, to have money. And what happened to them? If they play the game right, they will have the money. Some, some have sacrificed their husband, their wives, to have money. And if they play the game right according to satanic rules, they will have the money. But the problem is they will not have peace. Because money does not give peace. The only one who gives peace is Christ. It is, the, it is the riches of God that will come to you without any sweat, without, without any sorrow. God will not have sorrow to eat. If you get wet in, in, uh, in the corner, corner way, in all this thing way, you, 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 you have sorrow. Added to that wealth, added to that riches, that the people in the world will not understand. They may see you happy, happy, spray money, <laughs> love you like that, but when you get back home, you are not happy. Be you, because you know the way you got it. You know, you know the secret behind, the, the, behind what you got. But when you have Jesus and there is anything he has given you, there is peace, abundant peace along the line. You don't love God. It's God that loves God loves us. And his loving is his love, his love to us has no end. It's eternal. Even when you were in the world before coming to God, he's kept you safe. 
That's kind of word Lord they have. Is there any need you think God cannot supply freely to you? Love is driven, it is love that is driven God to us. And because of this love, I don't know the need that you have here. I don't know the need that you have in your life. Because of the love of God, there is no need that you have that God cannot supply. It is a matter of time. It's a matter of time. Sometimes we think we need these things. But God knows we don't need them, you just want them. Because it's not all that you want, you actually need. Some of us, we, we lose our head because we just want this thing. And God knows you don't need these things because as soon as he gives it to you, because you don't need it, it becomes a problem to you. It takes peace out from you. There is nothing, listen to me, however hard, however difficult that it may be, that you actually need that is important to make your life better that God cannot supply. Don't keep dropping up and down, looking for God with such light, as if God is dead, as if God is not there. God is there. God is everywhere. There is no need in your life that God, he knows your position. He knows where, you, he knows you better than you know yourself. He see like, look, he, he, I told you before, all the water you're going to drink in your life, God knows the, the gallons of that water. He knows it. All the food you will eat in your life before you expire. God knows the weight of that food. Everything you're going to eat before you expire. God knows. Look, every, everything that you will, every page of your life, even though you may not have known everything, he knows because he knows the beginning from the end. So, do, let's see the scripture, Romans 8 verse 32. Romans 8 32. He who did not spare his son, his own son, but deliver him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. If God can give us his only begotten son, is there anything that God cannot freely give to you? You must be rooted in the Lord. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you go to a pastor and he's telling you, give this so you can receive this, be very careful. When you give me this and I can do this for you, be very careful. There is nothing that God cannot give you freely. Now in appreciation, you cannot reach to God. And look, if God, if, look, oh, praise God. Do you know that if God takes over your heart, is there anything you can withhold from God? If he takes over your heart, if God takes over your heart, look, if God takes over, is there anything, is there anything you take? You, is there anything that will be too big that you cannot give to God? That is why my target is your soul. If God can arrest your soul, there is nothing he cannot arrest in your life. He can arrest your time. He can arrest your talent. There is nothing that will be too big that you will not be able to give to God because you know that you can never in your life outgive God. You cannot outgive God. You cannot do what? If he can give his only begotten son for you to have eternal rest, what else can you give to God that will be more than that? You cannot outgive God. You will think that you are the only one giving. You cannot outgive God. There are people that have poured out everything. They pour it out for the Lord. And they know that God, they were talking about, I, I, I did not bring all the data to you. They were mentioning some people in this country that are example. I think they mentioned some. They, they mentioned the owner of uh, Lo, uh, Obi Lobby or something like that. I forgot his name. They said people like him. They said, according to that data, that they don't want to go ten percent. So they they went on like eighty percent. They went on ninety percent. So they will give God ninety percent of their gross income. Accountant, are you here? Which one is bigger, gross or net? Thank you. I can't they are here in the house. People have come to me, they ask me, Pastor, uh, can you explain to me 
I know innocently they came. Not that they want to embarrass us. They came to say, Pastor, can you explain to me uh, this issue of tithe? Uh, should I give to God after? Should I give, give to God? Don't let me. So I want you to understand if you're American. Should I give to God if when after I have given, paid my mortgage, paid my uh, uh, all my bills, uh, pay my all the allowances and everything. Can I just is it tight of that one I should give to God? Which means you have now what you have is what net. Even the net is even not net because now you have taken out your mortgage from net. The government will first take your gross and take everything they want to take from it, and then they will give you what? They give you net. Now from the net now you come back home, you you take your own net, you calculate your own net. You know, you take back your mortgage, you take out all your bills, you take out all the grocery, you go to more, spend all the thing, and then you say, uh, see, uh, pastor, this, this is my net. My net is now $100. Should I pay 10% of that? Of course. What I will tell you is that, what kind of blessing do you want? Do you want gross blessings or you want net blessings? So, the, now, the rest is yours to calculate. They said some of these people in this country, they were talking about these people, these, these Christians that decided to be giving God 90%, and they were owed on 10%. They said they never lack. They said these people, they never regretted taking that kind of action, taking that kind of step, that they know that they can never outgive God. David said, I was young, now I'm old. I've never seen a righteous forsaken, nor is sick begging bread. Brothers and sisters, I have superb eternal relationship with God. Don't exalt anything above the name of God. There is nothing you have that is yours. Even the life you have is not yours. The time you have to go around and make that money, it's not yours. Look around and see what have become some people. There are people that have gone out, they never come back home. There are people that die on the job. On the, on the job, they died. There are people just on a, a short trip, they cannot return back. No journey is small. It's all by the grace, favor, and mercy of the Almighty God who is sustaining you. There are medical practitioners here. Ask them what has become some people. Some people just treating a patient, they got their death. Treating a patient. Some people, they got their disease, just what? Trying to deliver someone else. And when you, God has been sustaining you. Some of you, you have been making contact with people with tuberculosis. You are not having it. You think it is, the, it is your doing? I have seen some doctors, they will wash their hands. After they wash their hands, they will go to the, the sanitizer. They will do everything. They will do that. that. They, they, there are some diseases that will, that, will, that will break all those protocols. Amen? It's all by the grace and the mercy of God. Let us release ourselves to God. Don't let us use this mathematical thinking. You know, one plus one. Uh, let me calculate my net. Let me calculate my gross. When you are working with God, release yourself. Look, I tell you the truth about God. The love of God is a mystery that ordinary, ordinary thinking will not be able to comprehend. He loves you. God loves you. Tell somebody, God loves you. I don't know how I can pour this out to you. But let's see what, let's see what Paul said. Let's see what Paul said. Let's see what Paul said. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We are going to read this and explain some of this thing and we are going to go. And see the conclusion of Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 3. When I read this, each time I read this Ephesians chapter 3, I look into the sky and say, God, you are just great. You are awesome. You are great. You know, you know how complex I am. And then you find a way to bring me back home. Sometimes God will know that you are too complex. He will bring a, a serious storm to your life. A serious storm that will change you from the opposition. Some people, when they sit down somewhere, they will be so relaxed until God will bring a storm. Bam! You see, the storm might be you are just fired. 
You are fired from a job. I will be wondering what is going, what is happening to me. The storm might just be you just thinking, I have to travel out of this country. Haven't you seen people like that? They just think, I need to travel out of this country. I need to travel out. And then they will just wait. That, that thing will just be, eh, eh. and then they go, and then when they travel out, they will face problem where they go. They will do what? They will face problem, problem that will defy all logics. And it's a training God was giving them so that when at the end he will release the glory, they will be able to sustain that glory. God, see, God, the way God does not think as we think. As, at, as heaven is so far away from the heart, so also God's ways. It's not like our ways. Don't use calculation. This woman reads me to calculate the thinking. You cannot, you cannot think for God. You cannot understand him when he moves. But what you have to do is to submit yourself to him. Tell God, here am I. Do whatever you like. I know that your decision is the best for me. Whatever he brings to me, I will take it. Apostle Paul said, I have learned to live in plenty and I have learned to live in scarcity. And, and that is how to live and be, uh, be, be worthy for God. Let's see this uh, Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to go. For this reason, I poured the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Paul became a prisoner for you and for me. We are Gentiles. According to the first promise, we don't supposed to share the same thing that the chosen Jews are sharing. We are Gentiles. But because those people, you know, sometimes there are some spoiled people, they are spoiled. It came to them, they begin to play game. Where? They don't want to have him, they don't want to receive him. Because they're thinking physical. He was thinking spiritual. And then now, as many of us that will not take him, we will enjoy. Let's see what Paul said. Because of you, I became a prisoner for Gentiles. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The issue of Christ is a mystery. That is why people in the world don't understand. Even there are some so-called ministers, they don't understand. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. The issue of God is only God that will open our mind to understand God. Look at verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel is a mystery. That a Gentile, a sinner like you, like me, now we become heirs of God. Joint heirs with the Son. Now we become a family. Children of the kingdom is a mystery that you are now accepted among the beloved. It's a mystery. It's a mystery that you are now special. Anyone that messed up with you is glad to mess up with God, honestly speaking. And honestly speaking, you know, God has done it several times. I mean, I'm not proud. I'm not being proud. If you mess with me, you are messing with Christ. Usually, I don't fight physically back when people want to mess with me. Because I know. If I don't fight back, when God is going to fight for me, you, 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 you will be shaken. And I'm telling you the truth. If you are listening to me or you are here, don't try me. Hello? Don't do what? Don't try me. Because when you hit me, if anyone tries me, it will hit the rock of ages. And it will turn to powder. I'm serious about this. If you look at me, I don't have any bandage here or any fudu, any sham here. I don't have it. My wife, you can ask my wife. I don't have, I don't keep all the, I'll ask my children because children, they are very inquisitive. If I'm keeping something under the bed or anything, the, the toddler will have known. They will have seen it. You know, yeah, you see, one, the lie is, 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 is smiling. They will know. If I put something in my mouth, I will make a mistake one day. I open it, they will see me put it before I come out. Amen? If you are a Christian, you are born again, you are standing for Christ. And nobody can try you. Honestly speaking, when they try you, they will eat rock. Rock of ages. People have given the testimony. They will eat what? Rock of ages. And they will regret. They will have eternal regret. Eternal what? 
Regret. That's why some people, those people who do, who do all this uh, sacrifice or sham, they first want to try the person they want to ask. They ask, can, I, can we use this one? Sometimes they will say, oh, don't use, if you use this one, your, your job is over. And they say, let this one go, let this one go. They will go and look for all those dead people that are walking on the street. They will go and pick one of them. They will use, the, they, they will use this one freely. You are special. Yeah. Nobody can mess with you. Yeah. I'm not saying you should try God. If not, I will say travel to those places where they use people for sacrifice. Ah. Go and tell them, try me. <laughs> well, don't do that. Because we are trying to do what? Try God. There was a man, they said he tried that. He said he saw Daniel was thrown into the den of lion. And then he walked to the den of lion. He said, I want to be like, like, like Daniel. Don't make that mistake. But when people just want to try you anyhow, they're going to meet the rock of ages. And they will never come back alive. Amen? So what? I, look at verse 7. Of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given to me by the effective working of his power. Now go straight to, past, uh, to verse 8. Look at the mystery. Say to me, who am I, who am, who am I less, than the, I'm less than the least of all the saints? This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The riches of Christ is unsearchable for those of us that are Christians. Nobody can understand or go to the extent at which God can bless you. It's unsearchable. And to make all see that, see what is the fellowship of the mystery. When I say the fellowship has been restored or, and the relationship has been restored, this fellowship is a mystery. It's not just ordinary fellowship of food, you take this. It's, a, it's, 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 an, it's an eternal, unseen fellowship. The world cannot understand it. That you, you, a sinner, high a Gentile, can have fellowship with the living God. Oh. Let's go to verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. You have boldness, you have access. Listen, you, a Christian, myself, a Christian that was a Gentile before, I have boldness and access to God by faith. You can call on God any time of the day by faith. You can lay on the altar your need for God by faith. You have access. You have boldness. Do not be afraid. You have boldness to challenge the principalities, to challenge power, because you are not ordinary. You are special. Because Jesus sealed it all. He is the signature and the seal of our salvation. Look at the conclusion of Apostle Paul. So easy. And we are praying after this conclusion. Verse 14. Say, for this reason, for all that I've said, from verse 1 to 13, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the old family in heaven and earth is named. Is named. That he will grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through, the, through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in you, in your hearts, through faith, that you be rooted and grounded in the love, I may explain it to you, that we are rooted in this love, the love of God, that can supply all things. Verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. It's only when you are rooted in this love, I may explain to you, that you'll be able to comprehend, you'll be able to think at least the width, the length, the breadth, the art of this love for you. Only that, you cannot give the dimension of the love of God when you are a Christian. You cannot give the dimension of all the blessings of God in your life when you are a Christian. You cannot count them all. And he said, 19, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The love I'm telling you, you cannot understand it with the knowledge, the, 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 the normal mental knowledge. You cannot you cannot. Apostle Paul saying this here. Now look at verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. What are you thinking right now that you want God to do for you? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are your prayer requests? God is able to do more than that. Amen? 
I just want you to relax. God is able to do more than your needs. He's able to do more than what you are thinking right now. I don't know what you are thinking. I know some of us, we are thinking, oh, if I can have lessons. Oh, if I can have the new latest Mercedes Benz. Oh, God, if I can fly, we can have play. That might be what some people are thinking. Those ones are little, 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 little things. Don't forget about those. Those ones are what? They are petite, like a Frenchman would say. Petite. It's too small. It's too small. It's able to do more than what you are thinking right now, what you don't even think that God can do. It's able to do. It's able to do. He said, according to the power that works in us. If you are a Christian, there's a power, there's a potential in you that you cannot finish until you are dead. There's a power that works in you 24-7. There's a power that resonates in, your, in you 24-7. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Listen, we are going to pray. I tell you this, whatever I have told you is not limited to this time. It's for all generations. It's from the beginning to the end. It's for eternity. All that I have explained to you is not ordinary. It's spiritual. It's eternal. It's something that the world cannot even comprehend. It's something that your enemy cannot know. And when your enemy does not know it, what do you think, can your, can your enemy stop it? No. He cannot stop it. So this thing is so rooted in Christ that no one will be able to go in there and uproot it. It is the signature, it is the seal of our salvation. I don't know what you are sitting on. I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know, I don't know. See, there was a story. There was a story that a lady gave on the, on the radio. And we're going to pray with this after this. We're going to pray. The lady lost her husband. And uh, the only the single house that she, she has, she was thinking, what, she's, what is she going to do with this house? Can she continue to pay the mortgage? But before her husband died, are you listening to me now, brethren? Before her husband died, some people have come around. They did what they call exploration of the area. They were looking for oil well. They were looking for oil well, where, how they can get oil well. So they did all the exploration, even before the husband died, some months late, some years. So the man passed, and the woman was thinking, oh, what is she going to do, what is she going to do? All the other issues, all the bees, how is she going to survive? As she was thinking this, this, this is a Christian, a Christian woman. She got a call. She got a call. Uh, they told her that the result of the exploration they did in the area has come, and that they discovered that there is an oil well in, a, in, a, in, in, in the lot. It was those people living in the ranch. It was like some certain acres. They said there's oil well there. But that this is what they're going to do, that they want to exploit the oil well. And that, this, they, that she has option. They want to go in agreement with her for every gallon or whatever of oil they can dig out of that place, they're going to give a certain percentage. Talking in money. The money, the woman was like, am I dreaming or is she sleeping? Then she, she said she wiped her eyes. Is this, am I, is it a dream or is it, uh, is it a real, real reality? Then the woman also immediately was talking to radio people for counseling. The, mag the uh, accountant or this uh, financial management people that what do you think she can do about this? And they were giving her advice. When this money is coming in, you need a manager to help you manage the resources. When you get to the level whereby you, have, you need a manager to manage your money. <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? This woman did not know that she was sitting on a gold mine. She didn't know that that little, little piece of land that she got, that there is a well that is um, a quiver. Of, of, of crude oil under the... Can you understand? That is exactly the life of some Christians. If not all Christians. We don't know who we are. We don't know the Christ we are talking that resident in you. You don't know what you carry around. You think we are just ordinary. The woman just thought that she, she was just living in one of those houses. One of those houses. One of those houses. I'm, I'm just in one of those houses. And this we are talking about America. 
This is not the third world country where the woman can disappear. If they do that kind of thing in a land in the third world country, they can make sure the woman will disappear. Bam! Anybody coming to that place will do what? So that they can have it for free forever. But this is, a, this is a place of the rule of law. That woman will have wealth for the rest of her life, and she will give the wealth to other, you know, uh, anyone that will succeed her. You are a born again Christian. You are sitting on a gold mine. Your life is hid in Christ. He is the signature and seal of your salvation. You must, you must walk, walk with, with, with boldness. Walk with, sometimes with pride. Look, it's not like I'm joking. I, I know that my life is in his hands. When I go, I know by the grace of God, if God wants me to remain where I walk, I will be there until I want to leave. I'm not going to live by your dictate. If I'm going to live, I will live by the dictate of God. And the life that I live now, I'm not going to live this life. I'm not going to die in this place until God wants me to go. So if you are thinking I'm going right now, I'm not going yet. Pastors, I'm not doing what? I'm not going yet. Amen? Until God says it's time to go. Where you are, <laughs> hallelujah. Where you are, you is, see, your father owns the land. Don't let anybody go and I'll be bragging, I'll be bragging, I'll be bragging. Some people say I'm a police officer. And so what if you're a police officer and call? What has that got to do with God? God can do all things all the time. There is nothing that has ever gone out of hand with God. With God, all things are possible. Live a life of positive. That God is what? Is able to do all things. Don't think negative. Think of the fact that God is able to do all things. Father, we bless you, worship you. We honor you because you are so good. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that we have to know you. You are the signature and the seal of our salvation. We thank you because you offer yourself. You, you are the price. We want to thank you because you give yourself for us so that we can live. We are not taking you for granted. We appreciate you. As many that are here that have not given your life, their lives to you, Father, I pray that you, they will not have any rest until they surrender to you. As many that are listening, on, uh, listening to this message and uh, they have not given their lives to you, I pray, Lord, that they will have no rest until they come to you and accept you and repent and turn around, turn in the opposite direction of their ways of sin and then walk in your way. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for the provisions you have made for us. They can never go dry. Thank you, Lord, because you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what I'm praying on right now. According to the power that resident in all of us. And to you be all glory, honor, and adoration. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord.